Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. And welcome to today's webinar, BRCGS Rules Review, Standards Launching in 2021, and the 2021 Conference. My name's Amy. I'm a member of the marketing team at Perry Johnson Registrar's Food Safety, Inc., and I'll be facilitating today's webinar and offering technical support to our speakers. Today, we're very excited to have two guests from BRCGS for the presentation, and I will be introducing them to you in a little bit. But before we get started, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping notes. To ensure audio quality, all attendees are on mute. However, we do absolutely want to take any questions you might have. So to ask a question, you'll just go ahead and open the questions tab of the GoToWebinar control panel and type that question in, click send, and that'll come to us and we'll answer as many of them as we have time for at the end of the prepared slides. The most frequently asked questions we get are, where can I get the slides? Or will a recording be available? The slides will be posted to the pgrfsi.com website, uh, usually within 24 to 48 hours of the broadcast finishing, and a recording will be posted on our YouTube channel in the same time frame. So just really quickly, just to show you uh, where that question tab is, you just open it up. It should look something like this. It might be different based on uh, what machine you're working on, but you can go ahead and type that question in at any point through the presentation. You don't have to wait until the end. So type those questions in and send them our way as you think of them, and we'll answer, like I said, as many as we can. And then before I introduce our first speaker of the day, I have a quick polling question just to get to know who all is in the audience. And that question is, is your organization currently certified to a GFSI standard? Your four options include, yes, we're certified with PGRFSI. Yes, we're certified with another certification body. You're not yet certified, but you're looking to become certified or maybe you're not interested in certification at this time. So go ahead and get some answers going in there. All of the responses are anonymous during the uh, webinar, so uh, feel free to answer however suits you best, and then we'll get going. All right, thank you all so much for the participation there. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll, and it looks like a vast majority of the attendees today are already certified, which is always fantastic to see. All right, and we're gonna go on and introduce our first speaker today. And that first speaker is Paul DeMarin. He is the Senior Vice President of Food Safety and Supply Chain at PGRFSI. Paul joined us back in January of this year and has over 35 years of experience in the hospitality, service, and retail agri-food sectors. Before he came to PGRFSI, Paul worked for 15 years in the certification industry with clients in every sector from food safety and supply chain to brand protection and quality. Paul has also worked for many years in management system certification. And before that, Paul was a professional chef and a consultant for over 20 years in major hotel chains, restaurants, private golf courses, and food service organizations. So I'm gonna hand things over to Paul and you can take it away whenever you're ready. Great, thank you very much, Amy. Uh, welcome everyone to, to our webinar. I know we have a packed house today, so it's uh, just absolutely wonderful to uh, welcome you all today and uh, we wish you all a very happy holiday uh, moving forward. As Amy mentioned, my name is Paul uh, and I oversee our food safety and supply chain division here. Uh, we have a lot that we're gonna talk about here today uh, during the webinar. Uh, just before we do that, I'm going to uh, give a very short overview as I always do uh, about our organization and I also have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Jessica and Paula from BRCGS today to discuss the upcoming uh, standard rules as well as their 2021 conference which we're all looking forward to. Um, so moving forward let me just tell you a little bit about the business. Um, we were founded originally by Perry Johnson, uh, Perry Johnson Registrars in 1994 and we've been doing certification and registration from you know the very very beginning um, we achieved ANAB accreditation in 1995 and then uh, we continued expanding for the next 10 years into our international markets such as brazil uh, japan spain italy canada thailand etc um, during that time uh, we also attained our ucas accreditation um, and then continued expanding overseas further in united kingdom and china in 2005, our PJ&A uh, division was founded, which is a healthcare technology company, and we specialize in medical coding and transcription, telemedicine, uh, virtual scribing, et cetera. In 2012 is when our uh, company PJR FSI was uh, born, and that was as the demand of third-party certification uh, in the industry for food safety standards such as GFSI. 
Um, we're headquartered in Troy, Michigan, and we're certainly a global organization. Uh, we've really been, you know, our, our part of our family of companies is, um, you know, in the registration, testing, and certification arena. Uh, we have offices globally around the world, and today we're conducting audits for, um, you know, many standards. We have about 30 in our food uh, portfolio, but everything from HACCP to GFSI, organic, gluten-free, uh, social responsibility, safety, PAT, and even the FDA audits. So now, <clears throat> you know, over the last eight years, we've really worked uh, with organizations in essentially every sector uh, in the industry. Um, everyone from uh, production and distribution to, um, you know, supply chain, processors, farms, retailers, et cetera. We work with all of our organizations to um, you know, help them continuously improve their program, but also to protect their brand. And we're very much committed to the, uh, you know, food safety certification space for our clients. We want to make sure that we deliver a, a, you know, a service that goes above and beyond what is out there today in the industry. Um, you know, we have about 460 auditors globally in about 60 countries who not only understand the regulations uh, and requirements or regulatory requirements of those countries, uh, but also equally important, the language and the culture of those uh, countries. We have uh, currently maintained a, a very high customer service rating with our with our clients, and we're very proud of that. So now moving on, um, our services we have, uh, you know, we essentially break them out into four key areas: uh, auditing and certification to third-party accredited standards like. Uh, um, GFSI, uh, BRCGS as an example, or the family of ISO standards. <clears throat> Excuse me, we conduct a lot of second party audits for our customers. That would be all of the unaccredited audits that uh, we've uh, written and developed the protocol on our end to audit, uh, such as GMP for good manufacturing, uh, good distribution, packaging, HACCP, cannabis and hemp standards, et cetera. Uh, and then we also do a lot of customer specific audit programs where uh, a good good example of that would be uh, McDonald's. They have an SQMS program, DQMP for distribution, and we're one of the approved CBs who conduct audits to their standard that they've written and developed. Uh, now, of course, we also have a great deal of uh, training solutions now. We actually started launching our training uh, program a few months ago, and uh, we've uh, been having a lot of uh, great success with that. We've partnered with an organization called PCR uh, Corporation. I know uh, Goranka and Rajko very, uh, 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 very much, and uh, they're certainly a great organization who are approved training providers. So we're very happy with that partnership. Now, if you take a look at our, um, you know, portfolio of food, as I mentioned, we have about 30 different programs uh, that we audit. Right now, today, many companies, uh, you, you know, they're subjected to many different types of audits uh, in the industry. Some could be accredited, like GFSI. Others are unaccredited. Some are client-specific, government-regulated, retailer-mandated. The list goes on and on. And uh, as I mentioned, we do work with most organizations uh, across all of those programs. Um, so I guess, you know, on top of that, we're also recognized to conduct many government type programs like FISMA, FSVP, or even the VQIP uh, program for the Voluntary Qualified Importer program where we were the first accredited uh, certification body. Now, this is just a snapshot of some of the uh, global accreditations and schemes that um, recognize uh, Perry Johnson Registrar's Food Safety as an organization that can be trusted and is highly regulated and helps, you know, uh, being a part of these accreditations helps us to maintain the quality of our work as well. And on many occasions, like we're doing today with uh, BRCGS, we partner with these groups to make sure that we have the most up-to-date information that we can give to you, our customers. Um, and we have a whole series of webinars coming up uh, in the new year as well. So that's it for me. I am just gonna take it to the end and say thank you everybody for your time today. Uh, it's been certainly some great news on the uh, vaccine front uh, and we, we're doing everything that we can to make sure all of our auditors and our staff and our, and our customers are protected during this time as well. So we're certainly uh, looking forward to, uh, you know, um, turning the corner next year in 2021. And I wish everybody a very safe and happy holiday. So I'll pass it back to you, Amy. 
Great, thank you so much, Paul. Um, for everyone else who's joined us since the beginning of the webinar, if you missed it, um, thank you for joining us and taking the time of your day to join the webinar. Um, if you have any questions that come up during the presentation, uh, go ahead and type those right into the questions tab of the GoToWebinar dashboard. You don't have to wait until the end of the presentation to ask questions, and we'll be getting to as many of those questions as we can at the end of the slides. All right, so let's get right into introducing our uh, guest speakers today, uh, and that will be uh, BRCGS was founded in the 90s by retailers who wanted to harmonize food safety standards across the supply chain. Today, BRCGS is globally recognized across both food and non-food categories and operate the most rigorous third-party certification scheme of its type. And from BRCGS, I am very excited to be introducing you to Jessica Burke and Paula Parejo. Uh, with over 18 years of experience, Jessica began her career in an environmental and food testing laboratory. After that, she held various roles in quality assurance and food safety in the food manufacturing industry, where she helped multiple companies strengthen their food safety systems and achieve GFSI certification. In her current role, Jessica has overall responsibility for the BRCGS Americas technical team and is the technical specialist for the gluten-free certification program, as well as the plant-based global standard. Paula is a graduate from the University of Waterloo and has taken her honors art psychology degree and transferred her skills to the business world. As a marketing strategist for the BRCGS team, Paula supports the Americas region and partnerships and marketing initiatives. Whether it's webinars, case studies, events, articles, or social media posts, Paula is your marketing contact. You may also recognize Paula's voice from BRCGS's podcast, Confidential, Confidently Compliant, a food safety podcast, where she in interviews specialists in the industry to learn the why in food safety. So it's my great pleasure to turn you all over into the capable hands of Jessica and Paula. And Jessica, you have uh, the mouse for the slides. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Amy, and um, thank you for giving us this opportunity to share with our audience some of the exciting things that uh, we've been working on. So the fully remote, or sorry, fully unannounced audit program has been operation, in operation for a number of years now, and uh, we know there are many benefits to this program. Traditionally, uh, unannounced audits have provided companies with an opportunity to demonstrate their confidence in their systems and procedures to the extent that they're willing to subject these un to unannounced scrutiny. Over time, uh, the number of specifiers asking for unannounced audits has increased as it provides them with greater confidence in their sites and suppliers uh, systems and overall culture. So GFSI has also recognized the importance of unannounced audits and have introduced the requirement for at least one mandatory unannounced audit every three years. Other GFSI benchmark standards, um, such as SQF and FSSC 22000, already operate a one in three unannounced audit programs, and we will all need to introduce this program during 2021. We recently published a position statement to provide guidance on the new unannounced audit program and uh, detail on how it will be implemented. This program will not affect the fully unannounced program, which will continue to operate the same as always. And while many of the elements of the programs are similar, um, there are some differences, and I suggest reviewing the detail of uh, BRCGS 079 to understand all of the requirements in detail. The new protocol comes into effect February 1st, 2021 for Food 8 and Packaging 6 and May 1st, 2021 for storage and distribution four, which is in line with the launch date. Uh, while standards like the gluten-free certification program and plant-based aren't GFSI benchmarked, and therefore this isn't a requirement for those standards per se, they will be affected since most applicable sites have combined audits. Therefore, it's really important to consider production for those types of, of products in the planning phase. So I don't intend today to go through the full detail of the new protocol, um, but in summary, all sites must have one unannounced audit within a three-year period. The unannounced audit can take place anytime during the four months prior to the audit due date, and um, your certification body must inform you within three months um, after the last audit to ensure uh, that the sites know if an unannounced audit will take place in the coming year. 
The procedures and content of the audit will follow normal standard protocols, including the management of non-conformances, uh, the audit report, etc. cetera. Uh, and grades will also be in accordance with normal protocol. Certificate expiry dates will be based on the expiry date of the previous certificate, plus six or 12 months, depending on the grade. And certificate expiry dates, um, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I've already covered that. So um, moving on then to illustrate sort of what a typical audit cycle uh, might look like, um, here's a quick example. So let's just say a site had their audit uh, June 1st, 2020 resulting in an audit due date of uh, June 1st, 2021. So that would be when their next audit is due. Um, they have their next audit, uh, May 20th and 21st of 2021, which falls within the audit window um, 28 days prior to the June 1st due date. Within three months after the audit, the certification body informs the site uh, that their uh, next audit will be unannounced. Um, the audit will then take place any time within the four months prior to the audit due date. So the unannounced takes place uh, March 1st to 2nd, 2022. Then in 2023 and 2024, they go back to an announced audit with the audits taking place um, in May. And then they have another unannounced audit in March 2025. So I just want you to notice that the audit due date never changes and the unannounced audit must take place within four months prior to the audit due date. So that's slightly different from the, um, the voluntary uh, fully unannounced audit program where um, the audit must take place within nine months prior to the, the audit due date. So we've actually shortened the, uh, the requirements there. So I've given you a brief summary of the new protocol, but what I really want to talk to you about today is how unannounced audits can actually benefit your organization. Traditionally, this has been a topic that seems to elicit fear in people. However, I'd like to quell that fear and demonstrate to you that it's not as bad as you think. We've been operating a voluntary unannounced audit program for the last six years. And there were some initial concerns from sites about things like um, logistical issues, management availability, and effect on grading. However, these have largely been overcome. We've also found that it usually has a positive impact on management culture, increasing the sense of shared responsibility for food safety. So some time ago, we went in search of the truth around unannounced audits. We wanted to understand the real impact they were having on sites. So we did this by performing a survey of the sites involved in the traditional unannounced audit program. We requested information from all the sites involved um, and we obtained results from 283 or approximately 25% of the participating sites. The survey was anonymous. 84% uh, of the respondents undertook unannounced audits at the customer's requests, and 42% had uh, more than one unannounced audit. So we found there were some clear challenges identified. Uh, for example, sites with seasonal production, um, non-consistent production or variable schedules were required to periodically update their status with their certification bodies to ensure effective audit timing could be planned. Another issue was with sites in very remote locations or with limited services. Um, in this case, it was crucial for CBs to ensure enough information was obtained from the sites to plan the, the logistics of the audit. It also became very clear that the accuracy and quantity of the information provided by the site to the CB were critically important in ensuring a successful audit. Interestingly, in terms of nonconformities and grades, the study showed that sites using the unannounced program were 9% more likely to achieve an A grade than those opting for the um, announced audits. This is probably due to the enhanced preparation and more robust food safety culture adopted by the site in readiness for the unannounced audit. We found there was no significant trend in the area of nonconformities. They were typically similar in both announced and unannounced audits. Overall, sites generally felt there was a benefit to food safety in undertaking an unannounced audit with limited added potential or realized cost and minor negative um, commercial impact. It was found that audit duration and thoroughness of the inspection were not impacted. And about 50% of sites actually felt the unannounced program was beneficial to their site, 
while 36% felt it had no benefit and only 13% thought there was a negative impact. Overwhelmingly, 85% of sites considered that the approach didn't alter their approach to food safety and 50% of sites thought that the unannounced audit provided a better reflection of their operation. When asked about continuing with an unannounced audit program, 42% of sites said they would choose to continue. When asked about the value of unannounced audits for their own suppliers, 36% would prefer their own suppliers to undertake unannounced audits. We also received a number of overall comments in response to the survey, and there were some major themes that came out of the comments. Sites felt that the unannounced program strengthened their food safety systems overall due to the fact that they were required to be audit ready at all times. They also felt that the unannounced audit was a more accurate reflection of the site systems and culture and felt increased pride about receiving positive results. Another theme we saw was one of teamwork and responsibility sharing among different departments. So rather than relying solely on the technical team, sites felt that other teams were much more engaged. The unannounced audit program challenged teams to ensure everyone was knowledgeable and played their part. And again, the same themes come through, um, always audit ready, uh, more realistic snapshot, more staff engagement and higher standards. These are all things we should be striving for. So in conclusion, before entering into the unannounced audit program, sites were faced with a great deal of uncertainty and fear. They were concerned about what kinds and how many nonconformities they would receive and how that would affect their grade. They also had concerns about key staff not being available at the time of the audit and the potential costs associated with ensuring appropriately trained staff. Lastly, they worried about scheduling and the risk of missed audits. After just one round in the unannounced audit program, sites were able to realize the benefits of making their systems more robust and increasing staff capabilities, which in turn promoted a stronger food safety culture and sense of ownership throughout the organization. So although the survey was conducted specifically in relation to the voluntary unannounced audit program, I think the results and themes that came out of it can be easily applied to the one in three mandatory unannounced audit program as well. I think it's important to see this as an opportunity to improve food safety culture by encouraging an always audit ready mentality. One way of encouraging this is by making food safety part of the roles and responsibilities for each department. Um, by now, we all know that food safety is not just the responsibility of the technical team. It must be a team effort in order to be successful. Incorporating food safety into all roles will encourage a sense of responsibility and accountability, and ultimately, good food safety practices will become habit. Internal audits are also a huge key su success factor and should be used as a tool for improvement and the development of a strong food safety culture. Make your internal audits work for you by investing in training and development of internal auditing skills and by challenging your systems, performing robust root cause analysis and implementing effective correction, corrective actions and preventive measures. The stronger your internal audit program, the better your food safety management system will be. And in turn, you'll be more prepared for an unannounced audit. It's also really important to develop as much backup as possible. Doing so will ensure that no matter when an auditor shows up, there'll be plenty of knowledge and expertise throughout the organization to guarantee a successful audit. And lastly, view certification as a tool for driving food safety and culture, not as the end in itself. So what I mean by that is certification should not just be about receiving a certificate. Audits should be welcomed as a way of challenging your food safety systems and driving continuous improvement. It shouldn't be scary or negative. It needs to be used as a tool. So before I hand it over to Paula, I thought I'd give you a quick update of what's coming in 2021. Um, we've recently launched issue two of our ethical trade and responsible sourcing standard. We've got a number of pilot audits lined up in multiple regions and expect there to be a lot of activity around the standard. Our food safety culture uh, excellence module has been in operation for some time now and has provided a lot of value um, to food sites. We know that culture is not only important to food sites, but in all organizations, and it's a key component of product safety. So this is why it's now an element of the packaging standard as well as storage and distribution. 
um, as we have also modified the culture excellence module so that um, it is applicable for those standards, offering sites a way to measure and improve their product safety culture. The storage and distribution standard has been revised and issue four is now available. Um, auditor and sites uh, training is, uh, is available from now um, over the next few months and audits to the new standard will begin in May. Uh, and lastly, the rewrite of agents and brokers has just begun and issue three is due to be, be uh, published in October of 2021. And uh, now I will hand it over to Paula to talk to you about Food Safety Americas. Paula, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you everybody for being here. And thank you again, Paul and Amy for inviting Jessica and myself. So moving forward with Food Safety Americas. So Food Safety Americas, in case you don't already know, is an event dedicated to the supply chain and those interested in connecting with professionals in the food safety industry. So the event, of course, is hosted by us, BRCGS, which as we've been introduced, we are a GFSI benchmark program owner, well known for our food standard, but we do have standards across the supply chain, which basically means that we have pretty good representation across the supply chain in the content and with the type of people who attend the event as well. Food Safety Americas is uh, one of many events hosted by BRCGS. Uh, you might have heard of Food Safety Europe, Leaders of Tomorrow, all events that give people the opportunity to connect with like-minded professionals or leaders within the industry. This year, we do have a new twist. Food Safety Americas will be delivered virtually, and that's pretty much based on the state of the world today. We as an organization wanted to ensure the safety of delegates, speakers, and our own staff, which is why we chose to eliminate the element of travel under these unprecedented times. So we are utilizing an excellent platform, which I will be demonstrating later today, but I hope this presentation will give you an idea of the amazing learning and networking opportunities that you can experience right at home. So let's begin. So when I talk about demographics, as I mentioned, we have our main events. Within a three year span, we have collected a little bit of data to kind of get an idea of who actually attends. Um, when wondering the big question, who will be there? Like, you know, we, we were considering our virtual event. This goes across the globe. Um, this would have been a representation of most of our physical events. So we have quite a lot of people that come from the UK, US and Canada, Europe, uh, quite a few from Asia as well, Latin America, Middle East, Australia, et cetera, et cetera. And in terms of the seniority level, we are looking at leaders. A lot of leaders like to come here. So if that's the type of room that you wanna be in, that's certainly something that uh, you can consider. Some people do ask, why is it called Food Safety Americas if everyone is welcome across the globe? So it's not that it's limited to just North and South American uh, sites or, or professionals. It's just that the content is tailored to this audience. So all the speakers are from the Americas region, which helps bring a strong perspective of trending topics that are relevant to this part of the world. But if you want to build your business connections in the Americas, attending an event like Food Safety Americas is a great way to get to know the players. So when speaking about the players, if you can take a look at the types of brands who participated in our main events, this is what we have. Uh, this could have been attendees, supporters, or speakers. But given that BRCGS are a rigorous program owner uh, who can support organizations across the supply chain of large, medium, and small sizes, we do know a name or two that tend to be a little bit on the bigger side. So when you see the attendance rates to the right, representing our 2019 and 2020 events, these figures are from physical events. So this is kind of a limitation that you would have with a main venue event, because you do have limitations of how many people can be in a physical space. Virtually, we do not have a capacity cap. So um, given the openness, lower costs per ticket, no travel, a lot of global access, we could be seeing quite higher numbers when in terms of the attendees rates. It all just is, will be based on the amount of support that we get and the people that are interested. 
So thinking about your business objectives, I'll just leave you with some questions. Are these the type of brands that you would like to be in the same room with? Would you want to learn from leaders in these organizations or have a conversation with their representatives? If you're thinking yes, that might be a great option to look into. So taking a look at speakers and content, I'm gonna speak about last year's presenters. So when I take the time to really think about what does our content represent, I came up with this terminology. So firstly, a lot of our speakers are reputable. They have lucrative careers in the industry and extensive educational and research-based backgrounds. Take, for example, Emily Greep. She was a PhD uh, manager of food safety at United Fresh Produce Association. Emily spoke about examining how whole genome sequencing is being used to trace the source of pathogens, which gained a lot of interest from attendees because she was able to take the practicum of the science research and bring it into a day-to-day -day context. Or John Spink, who is the director and assistant professor at, of the Food Fraud Initiative of Michigan State University. Food fraud is of course a hot topic. It continues to be a hot topic, especially during COVID-19. And this also got a lot of interest. When I say thought provoking, panel debates are a great way to amp up conversations and topics that really matter. And although that they can bring up some controversial points, it's really great to understand different perspectives to make everything objective. Weldon Williams, for example, was an engaging panelist who spoke about sustainability, ethics, and food safety with our global head of the ethics standard, Michael Wilson. And our own Jessica Burke also chaired a conversation with Michael Kramer and Daniel Herzog. Um, about allergen procedures to minimize risk and ensure confidence. These also had high engagement, but a lot of follow-up questions from the audience as they wanted to learn from the different perspectives that each individual is able to contribute in these panels. When I say the words about trending and innovation, the first speakers that come to mind to me are Dan Anglin and Makisha Cunningham. Dan gave a very exciting presentation about safety with cannabis and food. And Makisha, of course, was speaking about food safety audit schemes and initiatives. Between the two of them, these topics were very different, but brought forward new concepts from specialists in their field. And a lot of people love to see what was new and exciting. And when we talk about relevance, many speakers such as Frank, Saeed, and Noel all spoke about security, food safety culture, and the big impact of COVID-19 um, on the supply chain and their response to them. These topics were of course catered to what's going on in the world today, but I think that the major benefit of touching base on these topics was to showcase that it's relevant, it's happening today, and it matters. And so this is the type of content that we really like to focus on, and this is why we are using a regionalized perspective of creating the content. So what will the event include? You might be thinking, okay, okay, that's really great to hear about the content, but what else is there? Awards. Awards is a really big plus for the industry events because this is a great way to really showcase your team and show where you shine. We know that our standards have a lot of stuff that you have to do to achieve them and to achieve them well. So it's good for you to take a step back and really look back at your accomplishments, especially when things can be a bit more challenging like in this year. We do have six award categories, site of the year, approved training partner of the year, certification body of the year, auditor of the year, professional of the year, and our newest category, which is star performer of the year. The star performer is a reflection of the tough year that we just faced. People had to be agile, and we know that there were many members of the community who stepped up to the plate and who really shone. So it's time to give their names, tell us why you think that they're such great team players, and get them some free publicity. So this is a really great way to, again, put something towards uh, your name or your company's name when it comes to networking. In terms of networking, so this is a given, but just so we're clear, there will be available breakout rooms and sessions throughout the event, and you can make one-to-one -one appointments with individuals on the platform. It can be a little bit intimidating with vir uh, taking a virtual perspective, as many people think, oh my goodness, it's virtual, I don't get to go up and talk to someone. Well, there's a lot of different ways that you can actually network, and I invite you to chat with 
your sales team as they can teach you lots of things. But we also do have a podcast from Confidently Compliant that talks about strong networking practices and I invite you to listen. Treasure Hunt, just something fun, great way to test your industry knowledge and win some prizes and the supporters pages. So similar to any um, physical event, we do have exhibitor spaces and they are virtual exhibitor spaces, which have unique offerings for you as an individual to explore. So benefits of participation, there's quite a few options here, but just to highlight the main benefits of participating as an individual or as an organization, you are going to notice that they are a little bit similar. Uh, the main things that I do want to point out is that um, the biggest objectives is that it's going to be lower cost for you to participate, lower risk, but you're still going to get a high return of investment. The biggest thing is that you have a six month window to be able to utilize this exhibitor space and the platform as an independent attendee. And what I mean by that is you can actually come back to the platform, rewatch the presentations, connect with different members of the team, whether it's attendees, the speakers, or different organizations that are exhibitors, you have quite a big window, which is pretty great. If you really wanted to, you could connect with every single person on that platform, which is something you wouldn't be able to do at a physical event. So there's really lots of opportunities here to use your creativity and um, to get some really good marketing opportunities as well as a supporter. Privacy in the virtual events. So I know that this is always a big concern for a lot of people when I say things like, oh, you can connect to anybody. There is a level of privacy that's here. So when I say that you can have a good connection with people, it's up to the individual to personalize their own profile and they get to decide how much they share about themselves or their contact information. Although you can utilize the platform to contact anyone via the chat, there are additional elements that you can put in there, which I will show you in the demonstration. Being a supporter, so again, I did touch base on quite a lot of this. It's gonna be better audiences, it's gonna be a bigger reach. The global representation is a great opportunity, of course. And again, you can have your own exhibitor space, which you will be able to really personalize to what your company want to be able to offer the attendees. And as well, you don't have any limitations of a physical venue space, which is gonna be really great for your creative team. In terms of pre-event and post-event opportunities, you would be working with myself. So you would send us a message to talk to us about ex uh, an exhibitor space and I would work with you based on your specific package. For example, you might have seen our videos with Clipspringer. Clipspringer is a supporter of the Food Safety Europe conference, which we actually did a one-to-one -one video with them showcasing their space, showcasing who they are. And it was a really great video and had a really good turnout. So these are just different opportunities that you can have to engage with our pretty big audience. So if you want to get your ticket, you just have to visit www.brcgs.com slash events. And that's where you can get your ticket for Food Safety Americas or Food Safety Europe. And Amy, if I can get the main controls, I will now do the demonstration. You got it. Give me just one second to switch things over to you. All right, Paula, you're now the presenter. If you want to go ahead and share your screen and go ahead with the demo. Perfect. Amy, can you see my screen there? Yep, we are good to go. Fantastic. So everybody, this is our events platform. Now you're going to see here that I have delivery partners. I did choose this so that way you have a finished platform that you can actually see. The only difference that you're going to see from Food Safety Europe or Food Safety Americas is going to be the branding, but the main functionality is going to be the same. So when I had said earlier that you can personalize your profile, I'm going to just go here to mine just as an example. So with my profile, I brought up my own image, decided to fill out my name. You can actually choose whether or not you want to utilize um, showing your email address or not. This is that layer of security that I was talking about. It's really up to you how much you care to share about yourself. You can write an about section, put your website, put your contact information, locate your social media platforms, 
and actually choose in your privacy setting how much you want to actually showcase. You can put yourself available for video chats, chat messages, um, be visible in the app, et cetera, et cetera. You will have to let them request your personal data and that's when it will showcase it on your platform. If you don't wanna do those things, you can be as private as you want, but still benefit from participating in the event. I'm gonna jump right into the live stream. So this is a great example here. This is where all the magic will happen. Um, this is the chat section. So the chat section is so, so that way you can engage with people during the conversations and during the presentations. The Q&A is where you can go to the dedicated Q&A section to submit your questions based on the specific session. And you can write notes as well. So as you saw there, it was just starting to play. Again, this is a past event. So I was able to come back review the notes that I might have had from here and re-watch the same presentations, which is great. That really gives you an opportunity to sit back, relax, and just, you don't have to worry about taking notes diligently because you can always review it later. If you want to actually do some multitasking, you can do what's called show and pop out window. And right here, I can go and see the agenda, for example. When you have the agenda, you can actually star specific elements that you wanna see, go to my schedule, and these are the places that you wanna be. Again, lots of opportunities to take notes. If you want to take notes for a particular session, you can go there and you could also do it in the live stream area, which I had just shown you earlier. In terms of the attendees, again, as everyone can um, alter their own personal profile, I'm just gonna show you an example. I want to look up my colleague Manish. Manish is someone who utilized their own profile. They decided to showcase their email, video, meeting, and chat. But if I went to my colleague Jessica, her profile is slightly different. That is that specialization. Jessica was also a speaker. So you can actually separate the speakers from the regular attendees, which is great. So you can keep track of where everybody is. But realistically, you could go to any individual and send them a message. And I could easily chat to Richa. And if Richa's not on the platform that day, that's fine because she'll actually get an email notification to say someone was trying to chat with you. So even if you don't have her direct email address, you can still, excuse me, you can still communicate with her. In terms of the supporters pages, so this is actually really cool as well. I'm gonna use Intact as an example. So Intact really did try to use their platform uh, to what made sense for them. They had a description here, linking back to their website for specific promotions. They use their community representatives that were here, which I can go to Ryan and I can go and chat with him for a video meeting or a chat and I can easily see what else they have available. They have different documentation, their social media platforms. Other people have chosen to put videos. Other people have chosen to put specific offers. It's really up to you and your creative team. But the nice thing is because it's your own space, there's very little limitation of what you can and cannot do. And it's not invasive either for the end user, which is really, really great. And again, with the treasure hunt, it's just simple little questions. There won't be anything set up here, but it would basically just be a fun little challenge that you can do and event feedback. So there's always an opportunity for you to give us event feedback as well, uh, which is really fantastic. So we can always keep improving. But as you can see here, everyone, this is a pretty comprehensive platform. It's pretty easy to use. It's very accessible and you have lots of options to connect, network, and use breakout rooms and learn a lot of content. And that's pretty much everything for me. Um, Amy, you can take controls. All right, give me one second here and I will switch things back over to my screen. All right. There we go. All right, thank you so much for showing us that, Paula. Honestly, that's probably the best presentation platform I've ever seen. It seems super functional and very um, clever, especially I like the note system and the pop-out window. Um, so based on all of what Paula had to talk about, we have one more quick polling question for you all, and that is regarding whether you'd like to attend Food Safety Americas and if you would like to be updated with more information. So go ahead and respond to that and we will move right along to the end of the presentation so where we can start taking some of the questions that you guys have been sending in. So if you had any more questions come up perhaps about the conference, um, go ahead and type those in now and we will squeeze in as many as we can before the scheduled end time of the webinar. 
I'm just going to give this poll another minute or two. Um, and just a reminder, I'm seeing a couple of questions in the question tab about um, slides. The slides from the presentation today will be available from pgrfsi.com, as well as a recording of the webinar um, that will be on our YouTube channel. So if um, maybe you missed the first part of the presentation or someone else in your organization had wanted to attend and couldn't, um, you'll be able to um, access those and share them as you wish. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Thank you all for your participation there. And I'd like to thank Paula and Jessica for their time presenting. And we're going to roll right along into a little bit more information over here. Um, we don't currently have the list of webinars for 2021, but we do want to get your feedback. If there's a particular topic that you'd like to see a webinar on, or maybe you know uh, uh, an industry expert that would make a good guest, um, please feel free to um, let us know. We're always taking suggestions and uh, input on possible webinar topics. So just email us at pgrfsi at pgrfsi.com with any suggestions, and we should hopefully have a list of webinars coming soon. All right, at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the questions tab and start asking some questions of our presenters. All right, looks like we've got a good number today, so keep them coming. We will fit in as many as we can in the last uh, 13, 14 minutes here. All right, we've got a question here from Jenna. Uh, Jenna asks, uh, does the CB choose when the unannounced audit will be or will the facility choose the year? Um, so it is the CB that chooses um, the year of the unannounced audit. Um, so one of the things to remember with that is that CBs are going to need to change the way that they schedule audits in that um, one third of their audits each year will need to be unannounced. Um, so it probably wouldn't work if sites, um, sites you know, were, were choosing the year that they wanted their unannounced audit. Um, it, would, it would just make scheduling uh, much too difficult. So, so yes, it's, this, it's a CB. Um, but just remember that there is lots of notice. So within three months of your um, audit, your CB has to tell you whether the next audit is going to be unannounced. So they don't just, it, it's not a situation where you're, you're not gonna know the year that, that your unannounced audit is scheduled for. You will find out within three months of your, your announced audit. All right, perfect. We have a question here. Uh, Christine would just like to clarify, um, if we currently do unannounced audits, we will now be required to have an unannounced audit every three years. Am I understanding this correctly? Yes, that's correct. All right, great. Let's see. Got um, a series of questions here from Andrea. Um, she's asking, um, will we still be certified for the full year if they come in early, I'm, I'm assuming this means if the unannounced comes in early, um, it will go back to the original cert date, correct? Also, if we had our last audit in September, then this year, this next year, we cannot get an unannounced audit, correct? Correct for all of those things. <laughs> yes, all right. the, the understanding is right, yes. All right, excellent. Let's see who else we have. All right, we've got some questions here from Henry. Um, for context, Henry's company is producing flexible packaging for food. Henry is wondering, I have scheduled announced BRC audit for next March of 2021. The probable dates for the next BRC unannounced could be March 2022, 2023, or 2024. That's right. So your your announced your regular announced audit will take place as scheduled. Nothing will change. They you, they can't come back and tell you now that that you'll be having an, an unannounced audit. Um, but then uh, the following three years, so, so 2022, 23, or 24, that's when your unannounced audit could potentially take place. All right, fantastic. Um, Tammy is wondering, um, just to be clear, it was said at the beginning of the slides that if we are on the announced program, we can remain on the announced program, correct? If you are on the unannounced program. Okay. So yeah, so so we currently have we've been operating an unannounced a voluntary unannounced program um, for about six years now, and if you are already part of that that program, nothing changes with that program, so it's all still the same rules. But if you are currently on the regular announced audit program, that's when you have to start thinking about the the changes with the one in three mandatory unannounced. All right, let me see what else we've got here as far as questions. 
All right, Tyler has a question. Um, is the one in three unannounced coming from GFSI as a guidance for all audit schemes or is this a BRC specific rule in response to the surveys of unannounced facilities? No, it is, this is GFSI mandated. So every single um, GFSI benchmark scheme will need to put this in place. So there were some schemes that already had this in place um, previously, uh, voluntarily, um, but now GFSI is, you know, is basically saying that they, they see the value in it and, and all, we all have to follow suit at this point. Right, all right, let me see. Next question here. All right, we have a question here from Colin. Colin says, uh, what are the implications for some small companies where they may have, for instance, two managers who could be absent and three shop floor staff who are not fully conversant with the technical parts of the standard without that skill set, but are responsible for GMP and food safety? So this is when planning um, really becomes extremely important. Um, so going up to, to the, the unannounced audit, it's going to be crucial for sites to, one, make sure that they've given their CB a list of, um, of they've get, they get 10 dates where they're blackout, considered blackout dates where the audits cannot happen for whatever reason. So um, make sure those dates are given and any other information like, you know, start times, shift schedules, um, any of those kind of patterns, you know, my advice is over communicate so that the certification bodies can make sure that they're giving, looking at all of those, those things and giving you the best date possible. All right, great. Let me see. Um, question here from Kim. Kim asks, can a company provide blackout dates in the four month unannounced audit window? Yes, so they get 10 blackout dates. All right, fantastic. Let's see. Um, Shelly asks, for those who are certified already, when will the unannounced cycle start? 2023? So, it, I mean, it could be as soon as, as 2022. So some sites, I, I would say for each certification body, one third of sites are probably going to have an unannounced audit in 2022 because the protocol starts in 2021. So the 2021 audit will happen. And then within three months, your certification body will tell you if your next audit is unannounced. So, so there could potentially be a, approximately a third of sites with, which are having unannounced audits in 2022. All right, Christine is wondering, what is the cost of attending BRC GS America's virtual event? That one's yours, Paula. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Amy, you cut out there for me. Could you repeat the question? No problem. This one is from Christine. She's wondering what's the cost of attending the BRCGS America's virtual event this year? Okay, awesome. So if you take a look at our website, the prices do differ based on uh, whether or not you are a general attendee, a student, if you want to go in for a particular corporate rate. So I invite you to go to www.brcgs.com slash events, and then you can pick the specific um, application that applies to you. All right, thank you so much, Paula. Uh, let's see, um, we have a question from Arpan. They are wondering um, if there are any updates on how remote audits went this year. Well, I, I wouldn't say we have a, you know, a firm grasp on an update that we can give you. They are taking place for sure. Um, and. I think the biggest thing to say is that we're still experimenting with different types of technologies. Um, we're still, it's still sort of one of those things that, that we're getting used to. So it's, it's definitely happening um, and it's being used as a tool um, when, you know, GFSI certification just isn't an option anymore, um, you know, and we're learning best practices. Um, what I would you know, say about that is that if anybody, uh, one of the things we're doing is is looking for feedback from companies who have done a lot of these um, remote audits and, and, you know, trying to find out what best practices are, what tools people are using, um, what went well, what didn't go well, um, you know, and then hopefully we can sort of basically collect collect all this information and, you know, maybe that will be a future webinar. It's always possible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got a question here from Angela. Um, Angela's question is, um, 
since some manufacturing lines only want, run once a month, how will that work with unannounced audits as the line can't just be started up immediately? So this, this would be a situation where um, that would be something you need to communicate to your certification body. Um, obviously, if, if production only happens on, on certain days, it's really important that you tell them this is what time, this, these are the dates, um, so that they can plan accordingly. Because if, a, you know, if an auditor, if you haven't communicated that and an auditor does show up and, and they're turned away, that's going to, um, there, there will be repercussions for you. So again, it's it's very much, and I can't stress it enough about that communication piece, and and also making sure that you're you know you're updating the, the CB on a regular basis. So if you're a, a plant that or a site that um, you know production is continually changing, and you know one month this was your schedule, but things have changed, and and now the next month you're doing something different. You need to make sure that it's not just you tell them at the beginning of the year what your schedule is, and then. Um, and then you don't communicate again, you need to be sort of in constant communication with your CB to make sure that they can schedule appropriately. All right, great. We've got a question here from Olympia. Olympia is wondering, is the one in three unannounced audit a full audit or a GMP audit? It is a full audit. So um, all of the exact same requirements uh, will apply uh, for an unannounced audit as it will for an announced audit. Um, one thing I should mention is that uh, one of the requirements is that the uh, the on-site portion of the audit must take place, uh, you know, basically within 30 minutes of, of the auditor um, arriving on site. So I would say that's sort of the only difference in terms of um, looking at requirements. All right, great. We've got a question here from Pavel. Uh, what if you decide to work with another CB? Could you have your first unannounced audit the very first time you're working with the new CB? Uh, you could potentially, um, but what I would say, what I will say is that the history of um, certification will be communicated to the new CB. So, um, you know, we work on, we work with a, a certain platform and that platform basically lists, regardless of who your certification body is, lists, you know, whether the last audit was announced or unannounced um, and that will be communicated to your CB. So, you know, for example, if, and, and I would hate to say that any site would do this, but if a site switched CBs because they're hoping, you know, that their next audit won't be an unannounced audit, that that won't happen. Um, you know, the CB will have have visibility and they will they'll know that, OK, you know, the next one needs to be unannounced and they still will go um, with the unannounced audit at that point. All right, great. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question before we wrap up for today. So this one is from Charlie. Charlie's wondering, uh, will unannounced audits be taking place next year given the situation with COVID? We opted for a remote audit this year due to COVID and are concerned about the potential risks of having an auditor on site. Yeah, so again, um, just keep in mind that even though the protocol comes into effect 2021, it, that part of it is just about the communication. So it is not likely that any unannounced audits are actually going to take place in 2021. It's just about the communication piece at that point. So, um, you know, by 2022, let's, you know, fingers crossed, we're in a better position. And that's when the unannounced audits will begin to take place. All right, fantastic. Thank you all so much for such great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get to every single one of them. If you have... Um, some urgency with the question you had, uh, please feel free to reach out to PGRFSI or BRCGS to get some clarification. I'll make sure to forward all of the questions that we didn't get to to our presenters just in case they uh, want to respond to any of them directly. But um, any parting words of wisdom from our, our panel of speakers today? No, I, I mean, I would just say thank you very much everybody for the engagement. This was a, a great session and um, I'm, happy that there were so many questions and if you have uh, any questions that that we haven't answered um, as Amy said please feel free to reach out um, we're happy to help yeah and Absolutely. just on behalf of PJRFSI again thanks Jessica and Paula and of course Amy we really appreciate your time and uh, again happy holidays to everyone let's uh, hope 2021 is a much better year for everyone
All right. Thank you guys so much for attending. Thank you to Jessica and Paula for taking the time to uh, come and be our guest presenters today. Uh, we hope to see everyone on the next webinar in the new year. So keep an eye out for um, that webinar list should be coming out in the next, uh, I would say, next couple of weeks, hopefully, Paul. <laughs> see yeah. what we can get arranged <laughs> before yeah. or after the new year. Um, so in any case, I hope you all have a great rest of your week. Stay safe, stay healthy, have a good and happy uh, holiday season and a, a good new year. Um, have a great day. See you all later.